Gotta love Bobby D. Gotta love him. Hey, Bobby D looks an awfully lot like James Stephanie, right? Isn't that just weird? That's just weird. Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning to everybody who's streaming with us online. Where'd you go? You're over here now. Glad that you're with us. We can wave. Say, hey, everybody. They're coming to church, too. Good to see you guys. We are glad that you're here. Well, uh, tell you, I'm glad to be back with everybody. I had a, a weekend off last weekend. I heard Pastor Dale preach the house down last week. I hear he did a great job. You should agree with that, yes? Okay, good. Just checking. Oh, boy. Anyway, I had a great weekend off. I was home for my birthday with my family, and I watched a ton of football, way too much football. The only problem is my football teams can't win and can't score touchdowns, so... Man, it's Florida State Seminoles. We won yesterday, though, so that's pretty good. So, I'm, so we're still losers, but we're getting there. We're a little less, we're a little less loserish. So that's a good thing. Hey, so uh, I'm really excited to be here with everybody today because we are starting a brand new sermon series on relationships, but we're calling it Relation Slips. Everyone say that with me. Relation Slips. I'm mainly having you do that so I don't mess it up and accidentally say a bad word. Okay. Relation slips, relation slips, relation slips. So we're talking about relation slips over these next few weeks as we get ready. Now, all of us and all of us need work on our relationships. Anybody here need to work on some relationships in your life? Lots of hands, right? This is a common thing. This isn't uh, just for church people. This is for everybody. If you're an unchurched person, if you're somebody who's just visiting here today, man, this applies to you. This isn't just weird spiritual stuff. This is real practical life. We all need to get better at our relationships, especially around this time of year with Thanksgiving coming around the corner. Now, uh, you noticed in the Bobby D. Jacobs video, the music for Mail Time, anybody recognize what that was from? Jimmy Fallon, thank you, letters. Are my Jimmy Fallon fans, where you at? Yeah, very good. I think Jimmy Fallon is the real successor to Johnny Carson, not Jay Leno, in my opinion. But this is what Johnny Carson has to say about Thanksgiving. He says this, Thanksgiving is an emotional holiday. People travel thousands of miles to be with people they only see once a year and then discover once a year is way too often. <laughs> and so around this time of year, around this time of year, it's perfect to talk about our relationships. We could all, all improve in our relationships. So uh, here's basically what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how you don't slip in your relationships. I have a way that I want to first illustrate this. Lee, can you, the bag under you, I forgot to put that on stage. Can you hand me that? Can everyone wave and say hi to my beautiful wife, Leah? Hi, Leah. Very good. Thanks, sweetheart. Okay. All right. Now, uh, a few years ago, uh, Lee and I, we got married in 2009. We were living in Tallahassee, Florida. Go Knowles, like I said. I'm not a fair weather fan, I promise. Um, anyway, we were living in Tallahassee. Going to Florida State, we were working at Campus Ministry of Florida State, and God called us to go to seminary in a place you've heard us talk about before. It's called Asbury Theological Seminary. It's in Wilmore, Kentucky. Pop quiz, is Kentucky colder or hotter than Florida? Colder. Way, 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 way colder. And now, we knew that we had to prepare to go to Kentucky, but we're Floridians. We don't know anything about cold weather. So here's some important things that I've learned about cold weather. Anybody here ever lived in cold weather before? All right, where's my native Floridians? Yeah, oh, lots of native Floridians. Y'all need to take notes if you travel, okay? Brandon's moving to Kentucky in January after he marries that girl, Haley Log, right there. So that's going to be good. All right, so Bran Bran, you got to pay attention. You got to take notes. This is really, really important. You locked in. Okay, so here's some important things you need if you're going to go live in the cold. First off, you need a good jacket. Duh, right? Now, but here's some other things you Floridians might not know. Now, I was born in Seattle. I lived in Colorado, and then I grew up in Florida. So I had a little bit of smarts about cold stuff. Not a lot, just a little bit. So everybody knows you need a jacket, but you need some other stuff too, right? You need a good pair of gloves. Okay, no problem. Here's what else you need if it gets really, really cold. You need a good hat. Did you know most of your heat escapes your body from your head? There you go. It was worth just coming to church just for that. You need a good, you need a good scarf. Most people are like, I don't need scarves. You need a scarf when it's cold. Trust me. You need a scarf. But you know what the most important thing you need when it's cold? Most important thing, hands down. What do you need? You need shoes. Right. You need good shoes, a good pair of boots. You really, really do. Now, I'm going to show you the boots that Leah and I bought when we first went to Kentucky, okay? Now, <clears throat> ladies, here is Leah's cute boots. What do you think? What do you think, huh? Not bad? Aren't they super cute, right? Oh, my gosh. They're awesome. 
All right, so not bad. They're pretty cold. So these are my wife's boots that she got when we moved to Kentucky. And I'm going to show you my boots. And they're gross. I'm glad no one else is on the front row because you might pass out from the smell. So here we go. That was funnier than that. Okay. Anyway, so here are my boots. Good man boots. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Lee, can you take this bag, sweeter? Can you take that? Thank you <laughs> very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, so here are my good man boots. Somebody told us we had to buy them. And man, am I so glad I bought those boots. You can't really, if you're online, you can't see the bottom of the stage. Here are the boots if you're online. There you go. You can see them there. Now, uh, I'm really grateful we bought this stuff because the year that we moved up to Kentucky happened to be one of the coldest and craziest winters they had in a really long time. Like, not only did it snow a lot at first, they had this horrible thing from the pit of hell in Kentucky called freezing rain. <laughs> Is it rain? No. Is it snow? No. It's just ice. It's awful. So it already snowed several inches, and then it had freezing rain, so everything was covered in a layer of ice. It was actually a beautiful to look. I have some pictures for you guys I took with my old phone. Here, go ahead. Let's throw up some of those pictures. So you see the icicles hanging down from the side of the campus. Now, if I zoomed in on a lot of other stuff. So go to the next one here. And so what you see on all those branches isn't snow. It's a fine layer of ice encapsulating every single part of every branch of every tree. Isn't that amazing? Here goes another, here's another zoomed in one. Look at that. Perfectly, even around a leaf, perfectly frozen around a layer of ice. Here's another one. Look at this. This is my favorite one. Very, very, very pretty. Now I'm going to show you a picture of my boots. Go to this one here. Look at that. That's not my feet through snow. That's my feet breaking through ice into snow. Do you think it's slippery there when everything's covered in ice? <laughs> Dangerous, right? Dangerous. So here we are. We're from Florida. We had been living there three months, maybe at the most. We're trying to figure all this stuff out. Little did we know that not all boots are created equal. <laughs> For instance, my wife in the morning, she worked on campus. We lived on campus, so she would walk to work every day. I mean, it was just beautiful and gorgeous, especially in the fall. But when an ice storm hits, it gets a little perilous. These boots right here have zero tread on the bottom. <laughs> so these were boots, but they also happened to double as ice skates when she was there. We, now, we learned if she was going to wear these shoes, I had to, in my boots, thank God my boots had some good traction, I had to glide her across the campus on the ice all the way to her office. If anybody was looking from the outside in on this, they were first like, look at that. They're so cute. These newlyweds, he's walking her to work. And the other half of the people go, look, a bunch of stupid Floridians not knowing the right type of boots to buy. <laughs> right? So here's the point of it all. If you don't have the right foundation, if you don't have the right footing, you're going to slip. This is true for your relationships as well. If you don't have the right footing, if you don't have the right foundation, you're going to make a bunch of slips. And we're trying to avoid those here today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them now. If you haven't pulled out your sermon notes, go ahead and do that. We're in the Gospel of Luke. So it's in the New Testament. It's the third book of the New Testament. As you're turning there, it's going to be on your notes. It's going to be on the screen. You can open up whatever app you read the Bible in if you do it on your phone. Luke is... Um, we studied the Gospel of Luke a little bit earlier in the year, uh, particularly following in the series we did on the book of Acts called Chapter 2. Luke also wrote that. This is his first volume. Luke was a doctor who pretty much did a research uh, project on the life of Jesus. And so this is a thoroughly researched ancient biography of the life of Jesus Christ. And we're here in Luke Chapter 2, verse 52. This is a very obscure verse in the Scriptures where you might not be familiar with it, and it's easy to pass on by, but we're just going to read it here. So Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Now this is following, this is, uh, well, we'll get into background here in a minute. 52, here we go. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your presence this morning. God, I thank you that you're not the God we have to beg to be here, to be with us as we stream online. You are already here. We're not waiting for you. You are waiting for us. 
So speak to hearts, change lives. Come help us. Help us to know you and walk in your ways by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 So let's talk about this. This passage, uh, the chapter, verse 52 is the culmination of, is the only passage really that we have from the scriptures of Jesus as an adolescent, as Jesus, as like a sixth grader. Most people think he was about 12 or 13 years old. This happens at the very end of a story where Mary and Joseph accidentally leave Jesus in Jerusalem. Remember the movie Home Alone? Remember, okay, instead of Macaulay Culkin, it's Jesus that they leave. <laughs> Bad news. So Jesus gets left in Jerusalem. It's an interesting story, but the most interesting part of it for Pastor Dale and I right now is these verses right here, that Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and with men. Now, we have a couple powerful observations about this that's going to set up the rest of the talk for this morning. It's going to set up the rest of the sermon series that we're going to be talking about. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, you can underline these words. Jesus grew in favor, it says, with God and man. You can see it there in yellow, with God and man, by man meaning that humanity, not just males. Jesus grew in favor with God and with people. Now this is a constant, constant theme of Jesus' life and his teachings. The, uh, it's this idea of a relationship with God and a relationship with people. We talked about in the last sermon series that we just finished in a conflict that Jesus had with the Pharisees. Somebody challenged him and said, Jesus, of all the commandments in this book, what's the most important? Which, by the way, they weren't trying to find out what was most important. They were trying to trick him, okay? Jesus, being uh, just an absolute genius in knowing the word of God because he was the word of God, was able to reply back to him, say, you know what the most important commandment is? It's this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And by the way, here's the second most important one, love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, those two summarize the entire law. There's like a boom, drop the mic moment. He answered their question and then went even further. Albert Einstein used to say that you don't understand something fully until you can explain it simply. You don't understand something fully until you can explain it simply. Jesus explained this whole book, saying it's all about this. Loving God and loving people. If you do that, you have fulfilled this book. Powerful, right? Very powerful. Now, here's what's fascinating about this. It's not only the great commandment to love God and to love people, but Jesus shows it here not just in theory, but in his actual relationships, there is love and favor with God and with people. One of the things I felt like I was supposed to tell you all here this morning to help you is to help pull this idea of religion, this idea of Christianity, out of a nebulous zone of it's just about loving God and people, but make it practical. Your faith practice of this journey that we call Christianity, if you are a self-declared follower of Christ, here is the measure of your spiritual health. Here is the measure of your maturity as a follower of Jesus. How is your relationship with God and how are your relationships with people? It's not how amped up you get, not how zealous you are, not how active you are religiously. What is the health of your relationships? How are you and God? How are you with other people? And by the way, you think you're right with God, but you have drama all around you in your relationships. Can I just put forward, you might not be right with God. It's a good place for an amen, because I know I'm preaching good right there. This is the deal. We're not just taking a few weeks to talk about relationships in the midst of all of our other preaching. This is the whole game. Your relationship with God and your relationship with people is the entire uh, model for how you are healthy in your spirituality, in your soul, in your relationship with God. And so, of course, we need to talk about relationships, and we need to avoid our relation slips. Now, not only that, moving on from this here, is, it's not just about God and man, but notice these three words. It's wisdom, stature, favor. Wisdom, stature, and favor. If you're underlining your notes, underline those three words. Wisdom, stature, and favor. Wisdom, it simply means this. Uh, it's uh, growing in intelligence, but not just knowledge, but in, in uh, uh, 
not just book smarts, but not kind of like street smarts, you know, where you're wise, where you know how to apply knowledge in the right way to make life work. That's wisdom. Stature, in a literal wooden sense, just means age that Jesus grew up. We're going to come back to that. And favor means kindness. That Jesus grew in such a way to where his relationship with God the Father, God was increasingly favorable and kind towards Jesus, even though God the Father and Jesus the Son are one. It still shows that as a human being, because we believe Jesus was fully God, fully human, the fully human part of Jesus was growing in his relationship with God, growing in favor with God, as well as growing in favor, where people were becoming more and more and more favorable to him. His relationships were working. Now, stature. Here's the real kicker. Here's the real observation that's going to open up everything else for us today. Stature, like I told you, woodenly means age. Like Jesus literally grew up. That's one sense of the word. There's points in the other scriptures where that word is used. Uh, for instance, when Jesus heals somebody in the temple, and they go to talk to this person's parents and say, how did this Jesus of Nazareth heal this person? And they say, well, ask him. He is of age. It's the same word. Ask him. He is of stature. It's like, well, you are of stature enough at 16 to drive. You are of stature enough at 18 to vote. You are of stature enough at yada, 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 and so forth and so on. But it also means something else. It means literally growing up. But that word is also used to talk about maturity, about growing up in relationships. And here's what I observe. All of us, as long as everything biologically is in check and in order with us, if we eat the right diet and take care of our we will all grow up from children to adults. But not all of us grow up in our relationships. Not all of us grow up in our emotions. Not all of us grow up in our emotional intelligence and how we relate to other people. If Jesus can, it shows us that we can. That's what we're talking about today. So the title of today's message is this, How to Grow Up. How to Grow Up. Up. That's what we're talking about today, how to grow up. Now, we all want to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. So Pastor Dale and I, we have four truths that we need to understand about all relationships. All relationships, whether you're um, a parent or a child, a spouse, a friend, an employee, a coworker, you name it, a neighbor. In all of our relationships, there are four truths we need to understand if we're going to apply them and grow in all of our relationships. And so here's the first one if you're taking notes. Write this down. Truth number one, it's this. We have been created to live in relationship with one another. We have been created to live in relationship with one another. Genesis 1.26 says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness. Isn't that interesting? The ours in there. Us and our. It's plural. Every single time it's pointing to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity where we believe in one God with three co-equal, co-eternal distinctions within that Godhead. It's showing us that even amongst God, and we talked about this earlier in the year, that their God is a relationship in amongst themselves with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if we're made in God's likeness, it means that we're made for relationships in and of ourselves. Notice this here, Jesus going on teaching. In John 17, 20 through 21, he says this, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. One of the things Jesus is saying here, especially in this room, everybody look at each other. Turn around and just look around at each other. The world's not going to believe the message of Jesus until we start getting relationships right in this room. Amen? Amen. We're made for relationship. We're wired for relationships. Now, in each one of the four truths that I'm going to give you across the rest of this morning, there's a correlating slip that goes with each one of these truths. So there's a truth foundation and a footing that you need to have and a slip you need to beware. Here's the slip for this truth. It's when we fail to make relationships a priority. When we fail to make relationships a priority, there it is. As we fail to make relationships a priority. Uh, the great Yogi Berra said this, if you don't go to somebody's funeral, they won't go to yours. <laughs> just let it, just, you know, okay, it'll get there. Some of you are going to get it at lunch. 
It's okay. I mean, I think this is the great relation slip sin of our culture here in America, especially in Palm Beach County. We are so busy that our lives squeeze out all of our relationships. And this is my sin. Anybody with me? Yeah? Man, it's where we don't make relationships a priority. You know, I've only been a pastor for three and a half years in this context. And by the way, I'm the envy of all my friends because I get to be one of the pastors of Community of Hope. So love you guys. Love you guys. I really am. Now, in just my time as being a young pastor, let me tell you, I've had the privilege of being with people as they're getting ready to cross over to eternity and at their deathbed. I knew some of you here in this room. I've been there with you. No one on their deathbed says, bring me my diplomas. Bring me my accomplishments. Bring me my strategic plans that we're able to execute and fulfill. No one does that. You know what they want on their deathbed? They want the people they love. No one says at their deathbed, I wish I worked more. No one does. It's all relationships. And something about knowing that life is not or that life is temporary. We have eternal life in Christ, but life on this age, it's temporary. There's something clarifying about that. See, that what's most important to God and what God wants to be most important to me is my relationships. And we slip when we don't do this, we don't make them a priority. It's truth number one. Truth number two, let's keep taking notes. Truth number two, relational success is not guaranteed or natural It must be learned. Relational success is not guaranteed or natural. It must be learned. We just don't fall into relational maturity, everybody. It's learned, and anybody with kids knows this. I've got a five-year-old, and I've got a two-year-old. It's civil war at my house right now, and uh, my kids fight over toys all the time. In fact, have you guys ever heard of the, the toddler property laws? You ever heard of these? Let me tell you these. These are property laws for toddlers. Here we go. If it's mine, it's mine. If it's yours, it's mine. If I could take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a while ago, still mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. And if it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> now, we all notice if you have little kids, like if you need proof of like original sin, you can look at kids and be like, oh my gosh, yeah. And so and my kids fight over all this stuff. Learning how to be good at relationships is not innate in people. It's a skill that you grow, and it's a skill that you learn. It's not binary, you have it or not. You've got to grow it. It's a skill. It's not natural. Not at all. Now, here's the correlating slip that goes with this as well. Here's the slip. If we don't become a student within the relationships we have, or the slip is we don't become a student within the relationships that we have. We don't become a student. We think it's either going to be this way or not. We don't put on our learner's head saying, I'm committed to learning how to do this relationship better. Listen to this from Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And listen to this, verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have grievance against someone. What bearing with each other means like this. You've got to learn to be with each other. You've got to learn how to do this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Friends, as your pastor, I want to help you this morning. Listen to me. Autopilot doesn't work in your relationships. In your marriages, in your relationships with your kids, with your friends, with other family members that you have, autopilot doesn't work and is a guaranteed way to ensure a slip down the road. Are you committed to being a learner in the current relationships that you have and to get better at them? Truth two. Here's truth number three. Every relationship can improve, but this is not necessarily easy or quick, nor will it meet all of my expectations. Again, number three. Every relationship can improve, But this is not necessarily easy or quick, nor will it meet all of my expectations. Hear me. All relationships can get better. Pastor Dan and I definitely felt something in our hearts as we're preparing this message that there are people 
who came in here in this room where you have an issue with another person. Some of you have come in here where your home is unhealthy or you came in here from unhealthy homes. And some of you came in here with broken marriages and you're not sure how this is going to work. You came in here with relationships that feel like they're dead. Hear me. Jesus brings dead things back to life again. Amen. Jesus gives wisdom when we don't know what to do. Jesus heals things that are broken. With God, all things are possible. You walked into this place in need of hope, and Jesus has come here to give it to you, that your relationships can get better, and God can resurrect dead things, heal broken things, and help you figure out what you don't know what to do, where you're stuck in all of your relationships. It's true. And, and, it's not easy. And it's not quick. It's difficult. As a pastor, I'm floored by how many people tried to talk to me to schedule coffee with me. I drink so much coffee, I should have stock in Starbucks. And they come to me with a marriage that got broken over a decade. And in one coffee, they expect me to fix it. I'm like, I'm a jabroni. I've only been doing this three years. You serious? (laughs) But in all seriousness, it's like, well, I can help you start the journey, but this took a long way to get here, and it's going to take a little bit to get on the other side of it. Jesus' power will do it, but it's not a microwave. Some of you need to come in here today with hope that Jesus can heal your broken relationships, and you also need to throw your relational microwave away. You need to pick up a shovel. You need to get ready to dig and to work. Amen? Now, here's the other painful thing with this. There's truth with this, but here's the slip with this. Jesus can do it, but here's the slip. It's that it takes two to have a relationship. It takes two to have a relationship. A, a relationship. Uh, sometimes these relationships won't meet my expectations. It takes two to have a friendship. It takes two to have a relationship. One of the best ministries in our church happens on Monday night at Celebrate Recovery. And uh, as somebody who's uh, struggling and, and, you know, coping with and God's healing me of my codependency, I really appreciate the ministry that happens on Monday night. And they close every single Celebrate Recovery with this prayer. Listen to this. This is the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, as in people, and the courage to change the things that I can, as in me, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. And here it is, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life. Reasonably happy in this life. And supremely happy with you forever in the next. Man, this, th- that right there, is one of the hardest lessons to learn in relationships. You can't make other people do their side of the street. You can do yours. Jesus' power is with you, and God does miracles. I've seen it over and over again. But it takes two, and you can't control somebody else. It's painful truth, but it's reality. All right, so here's the three truths that we have. Let's just recap these real quick. One, we've been created to live in relationship with one another. Two, relational success is not guaranteed or natural. It must be learned. Number three, every relationship can improve. It is not necessarily, necessarily easy or quick, nor will it meet all of my expectations. And here's the final one. A personal relationship with Jesus provides the best opportunity for all of your relationship success. Let's go ahead and throw up Luke 2:52 again on the screen. And Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and with man, with people. I want to tell you as a preacher, especially let me speak first off to those in the room who are the not yet convinced, who are checking out Jesus Christianity. And there's maybe some people here in this room or streaming online where you used to be a follower of Jesus and you got burnt and hurt by relationships and so you walked away. But you're checking them out again today. If that's you in this room, and I think there are people here in this room like that, I want to say this to you. Jesus is a wonderful example of how to get your relationships right. And even before people choose to become a follower of Jesus, they can start trying his teachings and his ways. 
Because I'm telling you, they work. They work. I'm convinced to the very fiber of my being that everyone's life would be better if they were a follower of Jesus. Everyone. Not easier. Notice that? But better. And so if you have some broken relationships here in this room today, maybe you gave Jesus a shot and gave him a turn to practice his ways and learn from him and to help your relationships. Now Jesus, he grew up in every capacity. And it's not uncommon for us to say to someone who is just relationally unintelligent, like somebody just says something stupid like, oh, just grow up. Anybody ever said that to people before? Anybody have it said to you before? Yeah, (laughs) I saw some hands sheepishly go up right there. Well, here's the thing. Jesus grew up, and he's here to help us grow up. And so here's the slip with this truth here. Here's the slip. Most of us need to grow up. Most of us need to grow up. I don't know about you. I need help with some relationships. There's some stuff as I'm writing this own sermon where it's convicting on my own heart where I need to become a better friend. In a lot of ways, I'm letting some of the most rich, cherished relationships of my life just dissipate. And I've got to do some work to get better. Anybody here with me? Amen. So listen to this. This is Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. If we seek Jesus in his way of relationships, all these things are going to be added to us. It's a beautiful thing. Now, we're going to conclude our message this morning where we're going to come to the Lord's table and we're going to partake in communion together. And here's what I want to say to everybody as we transition to that time. If you came in this room and you have a relationship that's dead, it's dead, you need Jesus and his resurrecting power. If you came in this room with a broken relationship and you don't know what to do, you need Jesus. What we're talking about a lot today, and what we're going to be talking about a lot all throughout the sermon series, is the wisdom that Jesus provides for us to apply to our lives to learn how to improve our relationships. But Jesus, I want everyone, I know we're shifting here, but I want everyone to look at me. Don't mess with your purses. Please hear me right now. Jesus has wisdom to offer you and an example to offer you. But Jesus also has power to help you. And that's what this table is all about. Some of you need more than Jesus to just be with you in your relationships. You need Jesus to be inside of you as you are fixing your relationships. And that's what's resembled here in the bread and the juice. There's nothing magic about this. It's just bread and juice. But if you approach it with faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, it could be your way of saying yes in your heart to Jesus. I need you, your ways, and your power in me to fix my broken relationships. It's your yes to him if you approach it with faith. So friends, I invite you now, will you bow your heads? Let's pray as we approach the table. The scriptures teach us that we should examine our hearts and confess our sins before we partake of communion. So I invite you silently in your heart to do that now. And maybe this is a time you need to confess your relationship sins to Jesus. Your relation slips. How you've hurt other people. Confess your sins to him now in the silence of your own hearts. The scriptures teach us that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us, and it proves that God loves us. So therefore, in the name of Jesus Christ, you and I, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and he gave thanks for it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat, and do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup, he gave thanks for it, And he blessed it and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take a drink, do so in remembrance of me. 
And so, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all that you've done and all throughout human history and the history of the world and of all your kind and loving acts, but the greatest one of all, the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus, on the cross. We gave his body and his blood so we could be forgiven of our sins and have our relationship with you be repaired and healed so that we can also repair and heal all of our other broken relationships. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread and juice. Make it be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be his body for a broken and hurting world. 